three, two, one. David, how are you? It's good to see you again. I'm doing great, Mark. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I had someone refer to you as the James Carville of e-grocery. <laughs> I hope that's a positive or a compliment. But uh, thanks it for is. sharing it. It is. Very well, good. We're, we're coming out of the political season. Nobody's yeah. watching the Sunday shows anymore. Uh, we've got a great a great show. Some really insightful questions, I think, that are going to dig at some of the issues, at least the trends that you're uncovering in the latest version of the monthly e-grocery insights. You know, anybody can just read their press release and get the numbers. But I really want to I want to dig into what you see are some of the underlying behaviors that are influencing what's going on in the market right now. The market continues to evolve. You know, we are still in an emerging state as hard as that is to believe. And I say that because, you know, we are continuing to see the rollout of pickup and delivery in its various forms and fashions throughout the U.S. So in some areas, we're already well past saturation. In others, we keep on ramping up. But overall, you know, availability continues to increase because of all the new ways and providers that are helping people shop online. It's becoming more attractive to shop online with a lot of the deals and discounts that are removing some of the barriers that people historically have tried to avoid, which is those explicit fees and charges associated with shopping online and primarily related to delivery, households shop around. I mean, it's no mm-hmm. different than in the physical world. You know, uh, most people don't simply shop with one retailer in the physical world, and the same thing is becoming more true in the digital. We've talked about this before, but the cross-shopping behavior is becoming more and more common. It's, it's You're seeing it month after month. Customers are using multiple methods to get their groceries. So how, how important is it uh, for retailers to, to test their assumptions about the customer behavior, you know, specifically their customers? And how does that translate to the strategies that they should be considering? Well, I think, first of all, I think it's extremely important for them to have as strong and solid and as rounded a view and understanding of their shoppers as possible. And I say that because, you know, it's just starting with their shopper, you know, if the retailer is really making decisions or sensing the environment primarily based on the data that they capture, then they could be, you know, really missing a big piece of the picture to help inform them in terms of, you know, how to respond. Case in point would be if you look at the average number of orders placed by a a household who did shop online for groceries in October. And the average number of orders, I think, was Mm 2.65. Now, if we just look at mass as an aggregate, households that were actively buying online for mass during the month October placed an average of 2.15 orders. Okay, so there's a gap between those two. And that gap, in theory, is where else other households are shopping, right? Mm -hmm. So if the gap between mass and that top line, for instance, that would imply that those shoppers are shopping other formats. That could be Amazon's pure play online for ship to home. It could be a supermarket for delivery or pickup. And the same thing is going to be true for supermarkets. When you think about that, you know, let's start with who are my shoppers online? We can identify them. You know, what are their purchasing patterns with us? We can identify that. But what we really need to expand our view of is who who else or where else are they going online? And what is it that's driving them to those places, right? It could be a recurring order that they've set up a subscribe and save on, like with Amazon. Mm -hmm. It, It could be that they're using a delivery service from another format or competitor because of some of the cost savings components of the features they've now introduced. Those things should all inform that decision. And retailers have the competitive intelligence, so I hope that they're gaining that type of insight. What I can see from our own interactions with retailers is while they may be making progress along that, they still have a ways to go. And and they're they're aware of that. So that's a real challenge, especially for, you know, the supermarkets who are trying to figure out how do we compete 
in this mm-hmm. environment that's increasingly benefiting you know the discounters and and really one Walmart is what we're seeing a permanent structural advantage for the large nationals the, the mass retailers I mean if a regional sitting around thinking that this is just temporary you know it may it may prevent them from developing this, this taking the steps they need in order to address the the key issues you've just raised we believe it, it is a fundamental structural shift that is occurring. Mm-hmm. And I say that in the present tense because it's occurring and only strengthening for those national players. And it's strengthening due in large part to you know, the progress that they've been making on their respective retail media programs. In terms of the strategy then to deal with a structural shift, what would you recommend? If you're a regional, how would you go about starting to look at how their business should change? Well, I think first and foremost is how, how are we looking at it? You know, a lot of times we talk about e-grocery or online shopping in isolation mm-hmm. uh, to in-store. We know it's not a binary choice. It's quite fluid and there's so many different use cases, missions, trip types that we need to be aware of. So we can't oversimplify it. But I think the first thing we may want to do if we're a regional supermarket is, you know, say, how does this impact our enterprise, our overall enterprise? And I say that because if you look at someone like Walmart, they look at retail media, for instance, and its impact on its contribution margin, not simply for online or in store, but rather both combined. And we understand that retail media is ancillary revenue with high margin and growth for Walmart and some of the other nationals, but that's not true for others. Why that is important is because we're seeing Walmart do certain things that they're afforded the luxury of doing because they have that ancillary revenue. So really it kind of begs the question, well, one, how do we look at this more holistically it could influence our pricing overall to mitigate some of the pressure online. It could be that then we realize, gee, if we don't have the same opportunity with this incremental revenue stream, how does that affect some of our own calculus? So I think you have to really start first with the, the big picture, looking at the business, not so much in a silo, but from an enterprise standpoint, and then, you know, drilling down into those customer behaviors, both in store and online, to figure out where those opportunities may lie for your respective business. I'm going to put you on the spot. Is there a regional that you think has remade their business in this environment and, and is doing better as a result? So that's a really good question. And you're saying someone who has righted the ship in the last few years, as opposed to someone who's just simply gotten faster. Correct. So, Mark, I think one that comes to mind, and I've mentioned it before, is Sprouts Farmers Market. Mm -hmm. This is a a niche player in the natural and organic segment, just like Whole Foods. But and, And that's notable because they tend to be upmarket in the premium segment, right? So they're not necessarily competing on price the same way a conventional grocer is. But still, they are going to have higher prices. What they've been able to do over the last few years has has been pretty impressive. And it really started with them segmenting their customer base and better understanding the needs, wants and desires of them and how they reach and communicate with them. There's a lot of information out there that talks to that. What have they done? They, They have shown that if you better serve the customers of shopping with you, providing them more compelling reasons to not go somewhere else, then you, you, you're you going to have a better chance. It's not a guarantee, but I would just point to them as one example. You know, I, I think it's a good example. To your point, it's about having this clear understanding of who your customers are and, and then to be able to segment them into, into uh, the categories that uh, you can then message and engage with. And I just want to be clear to or, or, and add my comments aren't necessarily focused on line, but rather their overall positioning. And I think that's part of the other issue is mm-hmm. it isn't that retailers are struggling online and flourishing in store. No, they're struggling everywhere. 
So there are some fundamental challenges that they have. And we have said in the past that competing online doesn't necessarily change the, the game for you per se, in the sense that if you had a you know, low brand equity with the consumer, online's not going to fix that. Yeah. If you have a great, strong brand and strong equity and customers love you and you went online, well, it becomes somewhat of a force multiplier because you may be able to reach a broader audience of those raving fans, especially with delivery. I, I want you to clarify, it isn't to suggest that it's what Sprouts is doing online that I was referring to, but rather what they're doing in general, specifically as it relates mm-hmm. to you know understanding their core customer. I'm glad you made that clarification. I think it is it is critical for regionals to understand how they position themselves uh, to their customers, and a lot it, of a lot of regionals are are struggling to reimagine what their promise is to their customer base without being repetitive. Given the structural changes in the industry that, that, that you've been commenting on, what are some of the unintended consequences of the shift to digital? Digital, in general, disintermediates advantages, structural advantages that supermarkets or conventional grocers would have over your discounters in the market. We have seen the same issue play out in food service, and Starbucks is a great example mm-hmm. of that, too which is, you know, as they ramped up their digital efforts with mobile ordering, order ahead, drive through, that all had promises of enhancing the customer experience using technology, but it also diluted the brand equity of that premium brand and really put it more directly in competition against, you know, Price value players like Duncan uh, McDonald's, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. apologize, <laughs> that, that really excel in those areas around speed and price. Same thing for grocery is when you look at online, especially delivery, delivery overcomes one of the structural advantages that grocers have against mass, which is proximity to the consumer. Yep. They are yep. located near them. So before online shopping, especially delivery, that meant people had to drive to and from where they were buying their groceries. So if your store is located, you know, a mile or less from the home versus five miles or more, like a Walmart or a Target may, you're right there, you're in a better position and yep. a position that you can defend so long as you're still closer. Another aspect of it is the quality of the experience, which has two components, quality of the product and quality of the service. And we know from previous research, and Mercatus was the one who sponsored it and and conducted it, I should say, was that the number two reason people shop at a regional supermarket is the quality of the product, right? And the quality of product in this case primarily are those perimeter perishable products, you know, produce, meat in particular. People want to get what they want. And what that means means something different to you and me. So avocados, someone may want them ripe because they're making guacamole right then. Someone else may not want them absolutely ripe because they're planning a meal for tomorrow or the day after. Same thing would be true with bananas or or other produce. You can go to the meat department. Getting what you want simply doesn't mean just getting sliced ham or sliced salami. It's about getting the thickness that you want. Mm-hmm. So in my mm-hmm. household, that means ultra thin. And the only way you can ensure you get ultra thin is currently going to the service count. These are things that, you know, if we can replicate online, will allow us to carry forward some of the advantages we have in the physical world of retailing into the digital. And some of those opportunities still exist in terms of oh, for sure. uh, grading that. But I think those are just other examples, Mark, when we look at this, that would kind of show the path that we need to be on. Because what is clear is that, you know, the virtuous cycle is only strengthening right now for the large national players as they continue to run up and, and, you know, build their media capabilities. That's going to slow down and plateau at some point. And Walmart has been extremely aggressive, which just means they got out of the gate fast. It could mean that, you know, they reached their effective run rate in terms of maturity quicker than others because of, you know, limited inventory. But 
again, is as we go forward, we need to keep all that in mind when we're trying to figure out what does it mean to me as a regional grocer. Yep. You make really great points. I, I want to shift the conversation a bit to more of a macro perspective. The, uh, the government assistance, the EBT and the WIC payments, those have come off and we saw at the, mo- at the time, you know, an impact on e-grocery sales numbers. And now the impetus certainly is uh, the, the deep discounting around subscriptions and membership programs that uh, at least, you know, you expect to, to continue for the next few months maybe into 2025 after the, the holiday gift giving season. Not to put you on the spot again, but what's, what's gonna be the next shoe to drop? Can you prognosticate? Yeah, I mean, if we had sensed that we were entering a period where customer retention would be more important than customer acquisition, mm-hmm. which is what we had you know, indicated, I don't know, a month, not months, uh, months, maybe a year ago, And now we're going through the tactical execution of the use of subscriptions to effectively lock in existing customers. And that's a a retention strategy. And fewer customers are now in the market or looking to try other services because they're not motivated to. Right. And the only reason they would be motivated to after signing a subscription is that that provider or retailer really flubs up enough that the person just kind of calls quits. So it, it just means that what we will be looking at now, in addition to we still need to focus on retention, is spend. How do we boost the spending activity of our existing customers. And mm-hmm. that could be in the form of trying to motivate or trigger a, an additional order. Again, subscriptions in part can do that, especially for those who are subscribing and only had been placing one a month or those who had two and then simply looked at the third one as purely free. So I think you know personalization will become increasingly important because that's going to improve the experience for those customers. And if you can continue to improve that experience, yeah. while not creating points of dissatisfaction, you know that's going to be key. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the relevancy of the experience that the customer has with the retailer it will become certainly a determinant of repeat purchase behavior. Yeah. Sure. So let me just throw it back to you, put you on the spot, oh. uh, put you in the hot seat. There, there, the, There's the work that we do with retailers, which, you know, tend to look at interrogating the assumptions, mm-hmm. uh, the questions we have, and then innovating, you know, sharing best practices that we have observed elsewhere with our clients. It, it's those next two that we bridge over to the area of execution with implementation and integration that, as you know, Mark, we tend to stay away from and why we look forward to finding partners like Mercatus who really complement our focus and can deliver solutions that ultimately retailers are looking for to address the issues or problems that we're flagging or identifying for them. So with that, you know, Mm -hmm. diatribe aside, from your standpoint, how or where can providers like Mercatus help grocers at this time, recognizing that replatforming entirely and throwing everything out isn't the solution, but rather mm-hmm. we need to find a, a different way forward to, to make the best with what we have? <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a question, David. I think, let me, let me put it this way. You're right. There's, there's a reluctance or a hesitancy to basically change the entire digital experience. I think there's, you know, retailers are being sold from a a lot of providers and a lot of providers make a lot of promises. I think uh, our advice is look at the gaps that you have look at the feedback from your customers, look for solutions that are complementary, but more importantly, uh, you know, look at, look at how the technology links to your your operations and are there means to streamline the experience to reduce friction uh, but you don't have to take a you know, 
approach to replatforming or reimagining what you have, you can make incremental change and experiment. That's been our, our, our advice and our approach. I think that's, that's good advice for anyone looking to at least compete in a, in a better way with, with the nationals who obviously have deeper pockets, more resources internally to, to take the hit on something that may not work. Yeah. Um, what, what, from your standpoint, whether it's, you know, a Mercatus client or other clients, just from mm-hmm. what you've heard or seen out there, what are some of the common pitfalls, mistakes that retailers or others are learning when it comes to making these incremental innovations? In other words, if someone thinks they're going to integrate the next solution because it aligns with their strategy, does, is it that it falls short on the execution side of the integration implementation, or is it that it really wasn't aligned with a, a, a sustainable or solid strategy? Yeah, I think it's the latter. It's like ha- having a holistic strategy. A lot of a lot of retailers like to tinker at the, at the perimeter, thinking if I make this change, it's going to make everything better. I think you got to look at the business fundamentals. And what is it that positions you as the preferred retailer to your customers? And then branch off from there. In terms of the integration, the onboarding, the implementation, the delivery of the technology, that comes down to uh, project management, having the right resources, and understanding how the technology can work with your other systems. Let me uh, take the uh, mic from you again, ask you a follow-up question. So, Mark, one of the things I've been wrestling with is how does a regional grocer think about and respond to this observation, which is Mm -hmm. how do we compete with Walmart if our online customer elects to shop with Walmart via delivery? Is there something that we offer that would compel that customer to think twice about that. And by that, I mean, is there something that we offer in terms of product or service that Walmart doesn't? I mean, we all know it's very, it's very difficult to compete with Walmart on price, especially if they're offering, you know, in addition to free curbside, free delivery now. I think it's, it comes down to the fundamentals of, you know, your assortment, the quality of your product, the ability to translate the purchasing of that, of that product and the quality of it to the online experience. Again, taking the friction out of the experience. I also think that it's the ability for the retailer to make good on their brand promise. The same brand promise you have in store needs to be reflected in, in, the, in the promise that you're presenting online, whether it's through a web experience or through a mobile app experience. And that's where they need, they really need to work with their technology partner to uh, make sure that the experience aligns with their brand promise. And do you find from a, a method standpoint, pickup and delivery, that at least the grocers that you've in, interacted with, whether you work with them or not, mm-hmm. have prioritized pickup over delivery or, or are they agnostic or do they see it somehow differently? Mostly all regionals started with delivery. Right. And, and, and curbside then clearly became... Uh, a way for them to differentiate themselves, and more importantly, uh, to reclaim the customer experience from their delivery partners. And we've seen a lot of regionals make that that step. Serving the online customer through curbside typically has been less expensive, and for the for the business. Now, the the deep discounting that's going on now, as you said, is throwing a structural wrench into into some of the economics that regionals have to face today. Curbside still remains a priority, but we also see regionals who are experimenting with multiple third-party marketplaces. You know, just not the Instacarts and DoorDashes, but expanding to Uber and uh, yeah. and recently Amazon in order to reach the customers where they think they are. So on that point, from a life cycle stage, you know, e-grocery really went through a major growth curve mm-hmm. in 2017, 2018. And then we had our next S curve come in 2020 in 21. 
now we're seeing the next S curve with with subscriptions. Typically, when you know we work with the retailers and you're in in a growth market like this, you're focused on you know growing you know market share through pricing actions, right? You you want to grow volume, but when the market starts to mature and you know flatten, mm-hmm. which it probably has for supermarkets as opposed to to mass, then you know we tend to focus a little more so on margin opportunities, you know, improving efficiencies, creating opportunities to take cost out of the system. But from your standpoint, Mark, when someone is now expanding to all those other marketplaces, you know, where's the conversation or is there a conversation about the, the importance or role of growing sales versus growing sales more profitably? I would like to think that growing sales more profitably is the key consideration. I would also hazard to say that there's a lot of retailers out there that just want to see sales growth and not looking holistically at what it costs them to serve those digital customers. Yeah, I I, I just wonder about that because it's a similar situation or conundrum that we see food service Mm -hmm. operators with, which is they go in there thinking that I need to be online, especially for delivery, because that's what my consumer wants. But yet what they find out is they end up losing more money doing that versus maybe not offering it at all. Right. I, yep. You know, they, yep. they give up the sales, but they end up making more money. It, it's a it's a tough nut to swallow if you're not in the leadership position because you just have to proceed as directed. But I think at the executive level, I just wonder what the rationale is for the broad marketplace expansion. I mean, for instance, if like we've heard in some cases, the third party marketplace is offering to support that retailer at no cost to the retailer and the retailer simply just shares a price file or item file or what have you, then that seems more straightforward. There's, There's no cost, so our margins aren't compressed. But what about those that do have some type of cost structure that they, you know, charge the, the grocers for? And then the second kind of second order follow up on that is if we weren't on all those marketplaces, do we believe that that demand would eventually find its way to our first party, uh, assuming that people want to shop with us? Because if people are only shopping with you because you're on Uber or DoorDash, well, that is a matter of convenience. But you know, if you are trying to nudge behavior in ways that benefit you strategically and economically, like Walmart, then you may not make yourself ever present everywhere, right? And if you look at Walmart, they're available only on Instacart Marketplace in the That's U.S. Right. And even so, in a very limited fashion, based on our previous research in terms of the top markets, I'm just curious, do regions not see or understand that? They may be aware of the long-term implication or risk to their business. But that's that's I think that's a, a question for another show. <laughs> yeah, no, the, that's fine. The that's nature, fair. That's the fair. nature the nature of strategic thinking amongst uh, regional grocers, short termism versus long term and um, perspectives. And and you again, you know, if it's a public company, they're going to have that quarterly pressure, whereas mm-hmm. the private company has a little more insulation against that. And, Correct. and it may be driven more by the company's culture and leadership commitment to e-commerce, as well as the leadership's understanding of it. Awesome. David, great show, as always. Really appreciate your contribution and commentary on uh, the latest uh, monthly grocery sales numbers. And of course, for you know the broader interrogation of Mark Ferrer's this episode. Oh, my pleasure, especially on the latter. Okay. (laughs) All right, folks. Till next month. This is Mark Ferrer and David Bishop. David Bishop signing off. Bye-bye.